Next session will be ACLF2, Treatment and Prognosis of ACLF in Asia Pacific Region. Moderators, please. Okay, next session is Treatment and Prognosis of ACLF in Asia Pacific Region. Um, management and uh, treatment HCL is difficult and big problem. Uh, we want to discuss this problem. Uh, moderator is uh, Keshi Sadomak from uh, Nepal and me, and discussant uh, Ashaka Aka Shukla. Aka, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, from India. Uh, okay, uh, first speaker is uh, Dr. Chen Eng Dai from Taiwan. Uh, please start uh, excellent talk. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your kind introduction. Uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Professor Chen Eng Dai, come from Kaohsiung, Taiwan. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to share this topic with you. And as the first speaker, we will have another two hours next speakers talk about the, uh, some uh, details about that. So I will have a general uh, overview for you. I have no, I have nothing to declare. Okay, the acute and chronic liver failure. Today, so I will talk about the definition, diagnostic criteria, and also we may talk about severity criteria and the prognostic scores. And also, I will mention about some treatment, for example, the liver transplantation in the ICU care or the plasma exchange, etc. Okay, acute and chronic liver failure, we are familiar with the acute decompensation for cirrhosis, and it is characterized by acute decompensation and also have organ failure. You can see so many organs will be uh, involved. In the recent year, uh, the different definitions and diagnostic criteria for the syndromes has been proposed uh, by different uh, international societies, you know. The main controversy now is a type of, the, of acute insult, maybe typically the hepatic, uh, hepatic or also maybe somebody talk about the hepatic, and also the stage of the underlying liver disease, whether cirrhosis or chronic hepatitis, or the history of the uh, previous uh, decompensation, and also the organ failure, uh, organ failure was also uh, very important. And the different disability and prognostic scores have been proposed. Let's look at the pathophysiology. Of course, for the chronic liver disease, for example, you have a chronic liver disease or the chronic hepatitis B, and then for the chronic liver, uh, liver disease, the bacterial infection and the, the uh, HPV reaction for HPV, maybe the insult. Then the inflammatory uh, uh, response will begin, and you can see here for the infection, the uh, pathogen-associated molecular particles or the damage-associated molecular particles will get uh, the inflammatory cytokines and the systemic inflammation response and also for the hepatitis B, the innate immunity or adaptive immune response exhaustion will cause the necroinflammation and then the liver failure will develop and after that the metabolic disorder will happen, the regulation of the metabolic pathway will have some changes and then finally uh, cause the multiple organ failure. Let's look at the definition of the acute uh, and chronic liver failure developed by the four different uh, consortia. Here, the first one is the ESO, that's the ESO Cleave Consortium. And also, you can see the second is the North American, and the, the uh, third one is the Chinese group, particularly for the uh, hepatitis B. And uh, you, we are all familiar about the APASO, ACLF Research, that is ARC Consortium. And you can see <clears throat> the first one is the uh, patients considering the definition that Apaso talk about uh, have the first episode where we rule out the, the previous decompensation. And also Apaso, our ARC, focus on the intrahepatic. And also the liver dysfunction is the central definition. And also the, you can see the attractive organ failures are subsequently developed. However, the, the other three consortiums, you can see the organ failure is very important. Even six or seven, uh, six or four uh, organ failures were described as the definition of the uh, ACLF. When we talk about the, the, the precipitants, we have to uh, identify the precipitants. 
for in management of ACLF. Here we have to overcome all the uh, in all patients with ACLF. For example, we have to check the infections by by all, what we can do, and also we have have to monitor the vital sign and even the uh, blood cell count or the biochemistry or the viremia or the uh, virological test for definition of the, uh, to define the diagnosis the, of the viremia. And also we may, may have the parasynthesis or chest analysis or something like that, or uh, most important, the abdominal sonography, et cetera. After that, we, uh, when the patient uh, meet the criteria for one or more um, the communist precipitant, we have to uh, identify that and treat that. And uh, if not, we have to check the rare or very rare precipitants. This slide just shows uh, by the, the ESO group uh, talk about the bacterial infection you can see here, and also a fungal infection or the acquired related hepatitis, GI bleeding with shock or drug induced injury of the brain or kidney, etc. So the potential common precipitant we have to identify. <coughs> Of that, we have to check uh, maybe maybe some uh, rare, for example, here for hepatitis, or we may diagnose genetic disease such as Wilson disease, or the autoimmune hepatitis, or the ischemic hepatitis, etc. So by this uh, identification of the precipitant, we can uh, manage the patient well. The second part, I want to show you about the prognosis models of the ACR. We, we know that we have several scores have been developed and proposed to assess a patient's prognosis, and the, which can uh, help us to make a decision in the care of the ACRF. The liver disease, we all know that the CHARP score, and also we have uh, used the male score, particularly for the uh, liver transplantation identification. And uh, for the ICU care, <coughs> we have many ICU, ICU scores, for example, the SOFA or the acute uh, physiology or chronic health evaluation, that's Apache 2 or even 3. For the society, I've developed the ARC score for ACL grade, and also for, uh, that is for, from the APASO, and for the ESO, I have the Cliff C organ failure score or Cliff C ACL score. Or the Chinese group for the hepatitis C is the COSSH ACL score, etc. They may be useful, these models may be useful and can predict mortality for our physicians to take care of the ACR patients. <clears throat> you can see the Asia Pacific, the APASO group, you, uh, you are familiar with the, for the patients with chronic related disease or the compensated cirrhosis patients will have the jaundice, that means the bilirubin more than five milligram per deciliter, or have the Coagulopathy, that is INR, more or equal to the 1.5. Also, if the patient develop within four weeks of jaundice by uh, appearance of the clinical ascites or the encephalopathy, we can define the population with the, the APASO defined ACRS, ACRF. Also, I have mentioned about that, that the, the inclusion uh, criteria is the patients with non prior decompensation, have the experience of a previous uh, decompensation will be excluded. So these kinds of uh, prognosis models, for example, the APASO ACF Research Consortium ARC score we use, uh, we can see there are three, uh, totally five variables. That is total bilirubin, hepatitis and somatic grade, INR, or lactate or creatinine, the level of theta. With the three points, we may have uh, assumption of the older uh, ARC ACRF points, and the scoring will divide it to uh, grade three, one, two, three. You can see the ARC score for five to seven is grade one, and uh, grade two is eight to ten, and the other one is eleven uh, to fifteen is the ARC score grade three, and uh, for the uh, twenty-eight days. Mortality, you can see from 13, for grade, uh, grade, grade 1, 45, to grade 2, and 86% uh, for grade 3, respectively. Uh, of course, for our clinical practice, if the ARC score more than 10, that means they have uh, severe disease and uh, will have high mortality rate and uh, should be listed 
for liver transplantation. So this prognostical or prognostic models we can use in the clinical practice. After this uh, counting ARC score, you, you can make a decision, for example, uh, this algorithm for management. If the patient have a higher, that means maybe you can see here, that uh, is uh, more than 11, a score more than 11, that means, means maybe grade three of all the patients get this kinds of treatment at day four and the day seven for evaluation. If the patient cannot respond well, you can see here, that means uh, the treatment response is quite poor. Uh, so also, uh, the supportive care only may be suggested because of a very poor prognosis. Of course, the other patients, we may try to treat the patient and evaluate at day four and day seven, you can see here. And if, okay, the patient will be listed for liver transplantation. So or just observe or follow up by the traditional medical or the common medical treatment. So the algorithm for managing of the ACL by these kinds of score can give us some indication or some guidelines to manage the patients. After uh, talk about the, the APASO, let's look at the ESO. Clef C scores. And the ESO Clef C organ failure scoring system considers the function of the uh, six organs, that is the liver, kidney, and the brain, and the coagulation, the circulation, and respiration. So you can see all these six uh, variables here and the get a score scales of the one, two, three points for the left, for the data. And the, after this one, the formulation, you can see here, we can uh, divide it or stratify the patients in four subgroups uh, with different risk of mortality. You can see here from the absence of the OF here and the, the 28 day mortality is about 4.4 percent. That is quite low. And also, if you look at the single or the, uh, the renal failure or something like that, or two organ failures, three organ failures, or, or the four to six organ failures, the presence shown here and the 28 day mortality will increase to 89 percent uh, for the A series three. That means four to six organ failures. Okay, after we get the Calif A series scores, also a proposed management strategy for patients with A series also proposed. You can see here for the patients with A series score, we can evaluate at day three and day seven. So the initial one week treatment is very important because we have to evaluate the response of the patient. And uh, you can see ACRF score also have grade 0 to grade 3, and the, the liver transplantation should be assessed and considered in the older patients with ACRF, particularly the patients with ACRF grade 2 or grade 3. That means more severe diseases. And after you uh, just uh, try to uh, evaluate the patient, whether have the contraindication for liver transplant. If no, okay, we may continue the treatment and uh, use that. And if yes, we have to uh, check the particular grade two and grade three patients. In the case with contraindication of liver transplantation, the presence of the four or more organ failures you can see here, or the cliff ACR scores more than 64 at the day three to seven. That means the patient will have very poor outcome. And also, even under these circumstances, we may withdraw of the care. Or the other patients, we can have also a longer day one. That means the six months mortality rate and try to get the patient be treated and managed well. OK, this is a Chinese group on study of severe hepatitis B. And here we can consider the function of six organs. That's early stratification of the patient in two, three subgroups of patients with different risk of mortality. With total bilirubin and the INR ratio, 
you can see here the kidney, brain, or uh, circulation or respiratory, uh, these four uh, organ systems. And uh, I, I want to mention about that, that this is really uh, applied to the patient with hepatitis B. And then you have a subscore of one, two, three, and according to the four uh, organ or systemic uh, conditions to get the score. And after that, with the summation, for example, if you have only the kidney value alone, okay, you may, you may see here, that is grade one. Or you have kidney dysfunction, and the other one, uh, organ failure or something like that, you can have these four conditions which uh, identifies as grade one. Uh, if by this condition, the mortality rate of 28 days is 23%. For the failure of a two organ system or more, failure of a three or more organ system, that is the grade two and the grade three, and under these circumstances, the 28 days mortality more than 50%, uh, even 93% for the grade three patients. So by this scoring system, we can uh, also make the uh, prediction of the prognosis of the patients. Oh, the, uh, the formula was shown here. Okay, let's talk about the, some thing about the, the, the treatment. Of course, uh, the, the next two speakers will also talk about that. So I want to uh, mention about the, some uh, conditions in Taiwan. So this is the data comes from Taiwan. And that is the acute and chronic liver failure patients with liver transplantation. So in this study, 64 patients with ACLF received uh, the liver transplantation in 22 patients from 22 living donors. Okay, the hospital mortality rate is 31%, you can see here. And the 8% uh, from the transplanter, which is significantly lower than the 45% for the non-transplant group. Okay, you can see the survival probability uh, by this way is the liver transplant better. And for the transplant free survival probability male score is very important uh, in patients with male score more than 30, uh, will have a very high uh, uh, mortality rate, uh, significantly than patients with male score less than 30. So I want to show here, uh, draw your attention, the survival rate, one month, three, six, 12, and even two, three years. For the transplantations in Taiwan, we can have uh, more than 90%. Oh, that is quite good. As the previous uh, speaker, uh, Professor Nakayama, talked about the, uh, just approach 90% of the survival rate. We can see the three years of survival rate is quite good for the transplantations with ACLF in Taiwan. Okay, the dynamic prognostication, uh, you can see in these 64 patients with liver transplantation, we can and look at the hazard ratios of mortality and the 90% confidence interval for the two important uh, risk. One is the INR, the other one is the ARC score. You can see both risk were increased in size and they become very significant after one week, particularly two weeks, uh, the hazard ratio is quite high. Okay, let's look at the risk factor associated with overall survival in this ACRS, ACRF patients. For all the patients, liver transplantation is a, a very good uh, predictor for survival for the patients. If the patient at the day 14 of the treatment with INR and ARC score, these two risks, we can predict the mortality very importantly and independently. This is for the old patients. If we look at the non-transplantations, actually the ARC score is the only one significant factors associated with the mortality. Uh, that is a very good predictive model for mortality for the non-transplant patients. So transplantation may offer very favorable outcomes to critical ill patients with ACLF and also the living, the living donor uh, liver transplantation can shorten the waiting time. Uh, in this condition, uh, the ARC scores at day 14 was an independent prognosis factor associated with overall survival in patients with ACRF. So this is Taiwan's data. 
I want to introduce another, also another transplantation group in Taiwan to report about the outcome of living donor liver transplantation treating patients with ACRF. You can see 112 patients with ACRF who underwent living donor liver transplantation. And the others, uh, non ACRF, maybe 12 to 124, that is one to two uh, matching by sex age and the body mass index uh, from 2000, 2000, 2002 to 2017. We can look at this one ACRF and the non ACRF patients will have a very good survival. Even the five year survival for the liver transplantation, more than 90%. Also in this Taiwan group, that's quite good. And uh, this is. Uh, Identical, not, not significantly differently between ACOF and non ACOF patients. And you can see the ACO group uh, with the ACF uh, gradient of 1, 2, 3. You can see ACO3 uh, or Morgan organ systemic dysfunctions can also achieve a good survival rate comparable, which is comparable to the ACO1 and the ACO2. You can see no significant difference between uh, these three groups. So comprehensive perioperative care and the timely transplantation is very, very important for these patients, uh, which play a very crucial roles in saving the lives of patients with ACRF. So liver transplantation uh, has very good outcome in Taiwan. Then let's talk about the ICU, ICU condition. The ICU condition, uh, if you uh, look at this, this is of clinical practice guide, I also have suggested the indication for ICU admission, uh, you can see here, that is uh, quite critical for the patient. Also have control indications for ICU admission. Uh, is kind of under some condition, for example, the comorbidity also with very poor prognosis. You have, you have known that they have very poor, so maybe control indications to ICU admission uh, under this con condition. And also the times of ICU admission, uh, uh, so just here, and you can see some indications for the mission at the intermediate care. Of course, that is a very critical condition, for example, the very mercial breathing or uh, very severe hepatic and cerebral palsy, etc. And we can also uh, assess the 30 days of the, the risk of day, uh, the, the days by evaluating the three to seven days. I have to talk about that after starting the full organ support system. And they also have the potential role for stopping the organ support. You can see very high CLIFC ACRF score more than 30, uh, 70 after uh, three, two days after ICU admission, you may consider. Okay, so in Taiwan, we have also have some reports about the, the patients uh, with pro, uh, admitted to ICU with prognosis score. So in this one, you can see uh, for the HBV, 37% the error, a quality was source for 39% more. And then you can see the ACR bread uh, by ESO cleave consortium will have significant, uh, significant uh, in, uh, in the independent uh, personal uh, modality, uh, that's very good value for the patients to predict survival or non-survival. And then you, you, I will show you here, there are seven, uh, totally eight uh, eight ICU scores uh, for these ICU patients. And uh, finally, you can see the CLIPC, ACRF, and the APC3. Uh, these two, A1C, uh, for these two scores, were considered higher than the other six models of 28, as well as the overall survival follow up. So for the patient of the middle ICU, you can use these two uh, very effective prognosis scores to predict the mortality of the patient for one month. Oh, this is the 24, eight days. For longer, you can see the 90, 180, or even a one year survival. Under these conditions for the long, uh, long term survival, the APASI 3 is the best prognosis factor. So, so APASI 3 displays a higher LLC and was superior to the other uh, predictors, can predict a longer survival. Okay, the other treatment, for example, the plasma exchange. At least met, it's a very review and the meta-analysis, we can see 20 studies involving the standard, uh, standard medical therapy. If we use the plasma exchange, you can see uh, for HPV patient, the PE is better than the SMT. However, for the alcohol-associated HRF, not good. 
uh, not superior, uh, that is quite identical. So the age model of the end stage disease so as uh, sodium score, etc., uh, have no significant impact of 30 days survival on this uh, meta analysis. How about a uh, lot is 30 days? How about the 90 days? 90 days you can see here. Some group of patients can also have get uh, the favorable uh, survival uh, for the plus one exchange than the same time medical care. Okay, so maybe have some roles in this condition. So the final conclusion is the plus one exchange may be considered managing ARF and ACRF patients who are not liver transplant candidates or as a bridge to liver transplantation. Okay, this is the organ system which may be involved, you can see here, so many organ systems. So the principal treatment uh, is shown here. Uh, the letter, uh, the the latest because we will talk about that, the so coagulation, kidney, respiration, circulation, the brain, etc. Okay, in the last five minutes, I want to talk about something about the chronic hepatitis B. So you can see here, for the patient with the compensated sources, of course, we now have a very potent nukes can treat the patient. So immediate treatment for this patient is uh, needed, and we have to do that, and the cross monitor for the tolerability uh, for the uh, all, uh, very rare complications of the, of the or side effects of the drug. So immediate treatment news for CHB is important. How about the, the A0 patient? Yeah, you, you also you can see the ESO clinical predict guideline. We have to treat the patient immediately if the patient gets the AC, ACRF uh, by the hepatitis B related uh, diseases. And also we can see here in patient with CHB related ACRF use uh, of the new sign analogs can actually reduce the mortality. So we have to immediately treat the patients, that is no doubt. Uh, however, how to uh, prevent? So I think the ACLs for the HBV is preventable. We have just talked about in previous sections, talk about the HBV prophylaxis. You can, even though that we, uh, patient with chemotherapy, immunosuppressive therapies will have the risk for reactivation of HBV, that may cause the liver failure or the ACLF. By this condition, we cannot tolerate that for the CHB patients with this condition. We have to get prophylaxis medication. So currently in Taiwan, uh, for the patients with uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy, we have the National Health Insurance Reimbursement, that is total free, providing the nucleus for the patient with chemotherapy or immunotherapy before seven days of chemotherapy until, until the six months later of the completion of the chemotherapy. So that is quite important. And on the other hand, I, I believe that uh, currently we broaden the treatment of HBV, for example, the gray area uh, in the immediate or in determinate condition, we treat more aggressively. Uh, for example, uh, in Taiwan, we initially treat the patient with two times upper living level of LT level. And currently we can treat the patient with abnormal, with advanced fibrosis patient. This condition we treat aggressively also may have the chance to prevent ACLF for these HBV patients. However, for the tyrosine kinase inhibitor or the immune checkpoint, you can see some HBV reactivation rate is also quite high, you can see. And the HBV related hepatitis rate is also maybe more than 10%. However, the HPV related mortality rate not yet been reported. So I think for the, uh, maybe we say about the prevention, uh, this is a uh, may need, uh, we need more treatment. So I want to stop here and uh, I want to invite you to Kaohsiung, Taiwan. Uh, we will have the Apaso uh, single topic on uh, Marford in June. Okay, that means maybe uh, two, three months later. And also I want to invite you to the Taiwan TDW rallies in October uh, 4 to 6 in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. So welcome to Kaohsiung, welcome to Taiwan. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Dai. Uh, very excellent talk uh, about uh, several criteria of HRF and management, especially transplant, uh, transplantation. 
Any question and any comment? Hopefully we can take a question and comment after all three talks are over. So you can have a seat there and we'll okay. call you later. Okay. okay. Thank you much. Uh, moving to next session, uh, we have uh, Dr. Akash Sukla. He is professor in, at uh, Seth GS Medical College, uh, Mumbai. He is expert in vascular disorder of uh, liver uh, and today his topic will be management of vascular disorder in patient with SELF. Professor Sukla, please. Good morning, everybody. At the outside, I must thank the chairpersons and the organizers of Apazal for having me here on this wonderful morning. I'll be talking on management of vascular disorders in acute and chronic liver failure. I have nothing to declare. If you look at the spectrum of vascular disorders of the liver, it includes butt carry syndrome, portal vein thrombosis, non serotic portal fibrosis or idiopathic portal hypertension, Abernathy malformation, and other rare vascular disorders. If you think which of these have a role in ACLF and where there is data, with butt carry syndrome and ACLF, there is some data. With portal vein thrombosis and ACLF, there is little data. And with NCPF, IPH, no data. And with other rare disorders of liver and ACLF, there is absolutely no data whatsoever. So I won't be talking about NCPF, IPH, and other rare disorders. I'll be focusing on butt carry syndrome and portal vein thrombosis. So with butt carry syndrome and ACLF, how are the two correlated? One possibility is a patient who is having butt carry syndrome, diagnosed or undiagnosed, gets another thrombotic insult, like a hepatic vein thrombosis, or occlusion of a hepatic vein stent, or blockage of a tip stent. And this precipitates acute and chronic liver failure. This is referred to as type A BCS ACLF. Second is basically you have a patient with butt carry syndrome and a non-thrombotic insult like a hepatitis A or a hepatitis E and that triggers ACLF. And the third possibility is you have a patient who doesn't have butt carry syndrome. It's a non-vascular chronic liver disease. For example, chronic hepatitis B or hepatitis C and this patient gets hepatic vein thrombosis acutely and that precipitates ACLF. This is referred to as type C. So you have type A, type B, and type C. Now this was the paper published from uh, All India Institute. 28 patients out of 553 presented with acute and chronic liver failure. 23 out of these 28 patients did not have any history of vascular interventions while the others had a history of endovascular intervention. The acute precipitating event was acute hepatic vein thrombosis in three patients, thrombosis of the stent in five patients, and in another 17 patients, the precipitant could not be identified. Nine of these patients were grade zero ACLF, four were grade one, six were grade two, nine were grade three, and 15 out of 28 patients died. Very high mortality. They did the multivariate analysis by three different models. In the first model, vascular intervention and encephalopathy were positive. In the second model, again, vascular intervention and encephalopathy were significant. And in the third model, vascular intervention was important. So across the three models, the only thing which determined whether the patient will survive or not was the vascular intervention. Unfortunately, in this paper, they did not look at the timing of the intervention. And therefore, we don't know whether the interventions were done when the patient presented with ACLF or after the ACLF had recovered. This was the kaplan weir analysis. The blue line depicts 
the bcs patients who do not have aclf who undergo radiological intervention the green line depicts bcs aclf who undergo a radiological intervention and the red line shows the bcs aclf who do not undergo any intervention as you can see bcs aclf with intervention and bcs child c with no aclf with intervention have comparable survival while patients with bcs aclf who do not get any intervention have a high mortality so how do we treat these patients with bcs aclf so type a the one where acute hepatic vein thrombosis or a stent block precipitates aclf the treatment focuses on urgent recanalization as per the anatomy so if the patient has acute hepatic vein thrombosis if you can do a thrombectomy or thrombolysis and put in a stent then that will be the preferred treatment or only hepatic vein stenting if it is a short segment thrombosis or tips if all the three hepatic veins are completely thrombosed for the type b where there is a non thrombotic acute insult precipitating aclf in a chronic bcs you again classify it into two types b1 and b2 b1 is the one where bud carey syndrome has been treated previously and these patients do not require any different intervention than what dr chen discussed in this previous talk so exactly the same protocols we have to follow but if the bcs is untreated previously then if it is bcs a grade 0 or grade 1 you would probably wait for the acute insult to recover and then treat the bcs or if it is a higher grade then you will opt for liver transplant straight away for type c where there is acute hepatic vein thrombosis precipitating a clf in a non vascular chronic liver disease all attempts should be made for recanalization if the patient has presented early this will include thrombectomy or thrombolysis with stenting hepatic vein stenting or tips and in those patients who have organ failure well established liver transplant may be the only option and the above may not work so this was a prospective study from the apazal arc group it was a prospective study for bud carey syndrome presenting as acute and chronic liver failure the manuscript is under review presently it included 70 patients of which 30 patients were type a 38 patients were type b and 7 patients were type c out of these type a 30 patients 22 patients survived and eight died or got transplanted type b out of 38 23 survived and without a transplant and 10 died or got transplanted and type c out of 7 patients six survived and one died or got transplanted when we looked at the predictors of mortality or liver transplantation in patients with bcs aclf two factors were found to be strongly positive presence of grade 3 hepatic encephalopathy or above and absence of any endovascular interventions were associated with higher risk of mortality or liver transplantation the other parameters like bilirubin creatinine and inr were not found to be significant when we looked at the radiological interventions in different subtypes and their impact on outcomes we found that in type a the out of uh, 22 patients without liver transplantation 15 were alive while eight patients died and out, out of these only two had undergone a radiological intervention so the benefit of radiological intervention was found clearly in type a as expected in type b and type c there was no benefit of doing an early endovascular intervention so this reiterates our point that for type a bcs aclf early endovascular intervention will prevent deaths or transplant moving on to portal vein thrombosis with acute on chronic liver failure there is positive data 
The impact of portal vein thrombosis on the natural history of cirrhosis itself is controversial. If you look at two longitudinal studies, one by Professor Maruyama and the other by Professor Dominic Walla, they actually found that there is no impact of portal vein thrombosis on the natural history of cirrhosis. But if we move to the US and we look at the UNOS database study published by Professor Engelsby, then that shows that presence of portal vein thrombosis is associated with worse, with worse outcomes in patients with cirrhosis, especially the peritransplant and post-transplant outcomes. Why there is a difference? The difference is because Engelsby study included patients with occlusive thrombosis only, completely occlusive thrombosis, whereas Professor Maruyama study and Professor Dominic Walla study had included patients with partial or subtotal thrombosis as well. And therefore, it is possible that complete occlusion of the portal vein may be affecting the outcome or natural history of cirrhosis, but not the others. The associations of portal vein thrombosis with acute and chronic failure can again be of three types. First, the portal vein thrombosis itself could be the acute hepatic insult for precipitating ACLF in a patient with chronic liver disease. This is more likely to happen in patients who have got early chronic liver disease like CTP, child pug A cirrhosis, rather than child pug B or C. It is because in child pug A cirrhosis, the hepatic artery is still normal and majority of the blood supply is to the liver is coming from the portal vein. While once the patient becomes child pug B or C, there is a slowing down of the flow in the portal vein and the hepatic artery buffer takes over and starts supplying more blood to the liver. And therefore, there's less likely to have ischemic insult if there is complete thrombosis in patients with child pug B or C cirrhosis. The second type is type B, PVT ACLF, where ACLF develops in a patient with pre-existing PVT and chronic liver disease. And type C is patient develops ACLF first and then develops portal vein thrombosis. Now, if you look at the data, there's only one study which has talked of the association of portal vein thrombosis with ACLF. This was the risk of different precipitating events for progressing to ACLF in patients with hepatitis B related cirrhosis. Out of 890 patients of chronic Hep B, 300 patients had, had ACLF. Out of these, 10 patients had portal vein thrombosis, of which five had isolated PVT as a precipitating event, which equates to the type A, which we just discussed, and another five were probably the type B. Grade one ACLF was three patients, two patients were, three patients were grade two, and three patients were grade three ACLF out of these nine. Four out of these patients survived. Unfortunately, that is all that the data that we have related to this. So when this rare disease comes in front of us, how do we really tackle it? So type A, where portal vein thrombosis is the acute hepatic insult, we must make all attempts at recanalization. We can start with anticoagulation in all these patients, but we must attempt either local thrombolysis or tips with portal vein recanalization. For type B, where ACLF develops in patients with pre-existing portal vein thrombosis and chronic liver disease, the treatment should be like ACLF of the acute precipitating event, like the previous speaker has discussed. Anticoagulation in this situation would be dangerous and therefore should be offered only if there is a thrombophilic state and no contraindications to anticoagulation. For type C, the portal vein thrombosis develops after development of ACLF. The treatment would be essentially like type A PVT ACLF if this is contributing to the liver injury further. To summarize, my dear friends, for BCS ACLF, you have type A, where the acute hepatic vein thrombosis or stent blockage 
in a patient with chronic BCS. Here, urgent recanalization as per the anatomy. You can either do a hepatic vein stenting, thrombus aspiration, or TIPS. For type B, where there is an acute non-thrombotic liver insult in a patient with chronic BCS, you subclassify it into B1 and B2. B1 is BCS treated previously. The treatment is to be like other ACLF. B2 is BCS untreated previously. The treatment of BCS can take place after acute insult subsides if the patient is grade 0 or grade 1. But if the patient is grade 2, 3 or above, then liver transplant may be offered straight away. For type C, where the acute hepatic vein thrombosis in a cirrhosis due to other causes precipitates ACLF, then urgent recanalization would be the first option. So either hepatic vein stenting or TIPS, but if it doesn't work, then liver transplant would be the best option. For PVT in ACLF, type A, where the portal vein thrombosis is the precipitant, all attempts at recanalization, so anticoagulation, thrombolysis, TIPS, and TIPS PVR. For type B, liver failure in pre-existing PVT, anticoagulation only if thrombophilia state present and no contraindication. We have to keep in mind variceal eradication prior to anticoagulation in this group and poor response rates of chronic PVT to anticoagulation. And type C, where portal vein thrombosis develops after liver failure, like we said, very little can be recommended. We may attempt recanalization if it is contributing to the worsening of the liver failure. But here, probably prevention would be the focus, but we still don't know what are the predictors. So prompt recanalization in type A BCS, BS, BCS ACLF is associated with improved outcomes. However, it's a rudimentary field. There is severe paucity of data in this aspect, and therefore we need multiple prospective multi-center multi studies to answer the questions that are there. We still don't have any data on NCPF and other vascular liver diseases. Therefore, I would encourage people to come together, join hands for the multicentric studies in this field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sukla, for uh, extensive uh, explanation of vascular disease and ACLF. Uh, our third speaker will be uh, Dr. Madhumita Prem Kumar. She is Associate Professor from PGI Chandigarh, India, and she will be talking on treatment and prognosis of ACLF in Asia Pacific. Dr. Madhumita, please. At the outset, I'll thank the organizers for having me here and to participate in this wonderful conference in the beautiful city of Kyoto. Uh, so I will be having some overlap, obviously, with the previous uh, presenter's talk. So we'll try to focus on what is important in Asia. So I come to you from Chandigarh, India. So the first thing that we're going to talk is the prognosis of ACLF and how it is relevant to Asian populations when we compare it with the European and uh, North American cohorts, which are well described, and Asia-Pacific centric treatments for ACLF. We all know that transplant is not very easily available in all settings. And often there are research uh, constraints that patients may not be able to opt, opt for the best treatment available to them. So let's look at what Asia needs to do. So when we come to the definitions, I mean, we have been having Having these discussions on and on, the extrahepatic organ failures are the main describing characteristics for the easel cohorts, and e multiple extrahepatic organ failures are what actually come into the naxal cohort. So there is an increasing severity of disease. In a parcel, we have the advantage of actually dealing with patients in a clinical cohort and in an early stage, before organ failure set in, and therefore before we can actually have futility of care. So the APASL definition probably is best utilized in clinical cohorts, especially in Asia. So if we look at these prognostic models, the APASL actually deals with the pre-ACLF idea because extrahepatic organ failures have not set in. And this concept of preventing ACLF has also been taken up in the new updated definitions for the APASL consensus. Whereas EASL already has organ failures and therefore limited prognostic uh, markers, I mean limited uh, therapeutic uh, uh, you know, modalities that are available and Axel is effectively where we cannot have too many care options available.
So the seven day, 28 day and 90 day mortality are defined on this basis. And possibly the seventh day ARC score of more than 12 is the best futility criteria in our cohorts. So that comes to the prognostication. I would like to say that the Asian phenotype of ACLF is somewhat different when it comes to the European cohorts. We have different immune signatures. So in this wonderful study from the HPV Chinese uh, group, the signatures of interferon related, neutrophil trap related, or rather the innate immune response, this is upregulated, whereas those which are related to the adaptive immune response are downregulated, so our patients are prone towards sepsis. We need to have therapeutic modalities that deal with this. The second thing that's interesting about Asian cohorts is, especially in patients with HPV, if we look at the metabolomics, they actually have a better prognostic model for predicting mortality in these individuals. And therefore, we need to focus on Asian patients, not only by looking at the MELD, but also looking at dynamic scores like the ARC model, which will actually determine which, will, which are the patients who will have organ failures. So what are the treatment modalities that are currently available? Critical care management is probably the cornerstone which will determine which patients will do better liver transplantations where it is feasible, but I'll be focusing on two modalities, which would be plasma exchange and other non-transplant modalities. So in the medical treatments for ACLF, we have the intensive care management. So the most important thing is to maintain the volume status. And of note, there's been an interest in POCUS or point of care ultrasound related monitoring of these patients and timely use of vasopressors in these individuals so that shock does not set in and the patients have adequate tissue perfusion. Maintenance of the neurological function by prophylactic and therapeutic modalities for hepatic encephalopathy appropriate use of ventilatory support and try to wean these patients off as soon as possible. Patients with HRS AKI and patients with ATN require very different therapy. So these patients need to be assessed to be in what state they are in. So volume status assessment again and timely use of terlipressin would probably be of use. Patients in Asian phenotype are very prone towards infection because of our, of our innate uh, immune system response. And of course, there's always a combination of two diseases sometimes. There could be alcohol-related disease in combination with drug-related uh, liver injury. Then there might be some basic viral. So there's often a triple hit in patients with Asian ACLF. So that is not really dealt with in the definitions from the West. So patients can come with, to us with acute decompensation like variceal bleeding. And of course, uh, the first speaker dealt with the timely initiation of nucleoside analogs for patients with hepatitis B. And of course, we need appropriate correction of coagulation system as uh, Professor Shukla has actually shown that the procoagulant phenotype could, act would, could also be present in patients with acute and chronic liver failure. So the organ failure supports for uh, the liver would be nucleoside analogs for hepatitis A and E is largely supportive. For autoimmune hepatitis, we do use steroids in some patients or we use plasma exchange in those patients who have elevated IgG and maybe as a bridge to transplant. In Wilson disease, there is uh, a lot of experience coming out from Asia on plasma exchange, uh, but most of these patients with Wilsonian crisis would actually require liver transplantation. And then drug-induced liver injury, there's no current data which supports the use of NAC, though it is frequently used. For liver support therapy, we use plasma exchange or CRRT, so we'll be discussing that. So depending on where the patients come with ACLF to prevent infection, we might actually use broad-spectrum empirical antibiotics at the outset and quickly de-escalate as soon as possible. We often use infection scores and organ failures to determine the time of uh, de-escalation of antibiotics and use uh, biomarkers such as procalcitonin and also fungal biomarkers like beta-D-glucan and galactomannan that le let us determine whether we should use antifungals or not. So empirical antibiotics and rapid de-escalation in ACLF is important in Asian patients. Coming to hepatic encephalopathy, this is an ICU requiring patient. So airway protection is important. Remember, these patients can be weaned off ventilation as soon as possible. A minimum amount of sedation should be used. And the idea is to reset the circulation and reset the precipitant for ACLF, hepat hepatic encephalopathy, rather than focusing on ammonia. So even though ammonia reduction is a component of the management of encephalopathy in these patients, most of the time it would be alcohol withdrawal, there would also be an element of dyselectrolytemia, there would be an element of 
uh, sedative use. So all of this needs to be tackled when dealing with ACLF HE. So although I have put in the, uh, the evidence for ammonia reduction, be it lactulose, which is the primary mode of treatment, rifaximin has very low data. And there's a recent ARI trial, which has shown that addition of rifaximin to uh, broad spectrum antibiotics has no additional benefit in the management of hepatic encephalopathy. There is a uh, use of PEG in some patients where lactulose alone does not work, provided they don't have AKI or hyponatremia. And in patients who have a pre predominant liver phenotype, that is, they don't have AKI, plasma exchange is a good modality for management of hepatic encephalopathy. In patients who have concomitant AKI, CRRT can also help with management of hepatic encephalopathy and ACLF with HE. The next thing that we come to is acute kidney injury. The first thing is important to know whether they are volume replete or not. In point of care ultrasound can actually, based on cardiac index and IVC, we can actually tell whether the patient is pre-renal. So volume expansion, once that is done, and we know the patient is volume expanded with adequate cardiac uh, reserve, early addition of terlipressin, and this is data from ILBS, there's a rapid day seven reversal. So HRS AKI, timely use of terlipressin and adequate volume status evaluation is the best. So we need to know on the basis of POCUS, what is the volume status in these patients. Accordingly, we would use albumin for volume expansion, but we might have to initiate terlipressin early. Even if the patient presents to you late and you end up giving a lot of albumin, that is what precipitates pulmonary edema. So it would be advisable to actually assess when terlipressin is required, use it early, and in our data, the reversibility of HRS AKI is up to 71%. And in those patients, we need to decide for CRRT and SLED early if you're suspecting SLED or if HRS is non reversed at three or four days. So if there's hyperkalemia, there is acidemia, there's volume overload, there's ongoing respiratory failure, these are patients who would have to go towards CRRT early rather than trying to go on giving volume expansion and early present. So the management algorithm for circulatory failure would also be based on POCUS. Again, there is a lot of data from Asia depending on the kind of fluids used, but most of it is extrapolated from cirrhosis. At our center, we largely use 20% albumin for maintenance and early expansion is done with uh, balanced salt solutions. So we need to be careful about the osmolarity and the sodium of these patients because this would what can precipitate pulmonary edema. So coming to the role of circulation and the lung, as an overlap, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy itself in patients who are coming with severe sepsis is a predictor of, uh, of shock. It is a predictor of outcomes at uh, 28 days and 90 days. And when we incorporate the parameters of E by E prime and E prime velocity, which are defining characteristics for diastology dysfunction in cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, we find that it performs much better than MELD sodium and also performs better than CLIFC ACLF. Uh, as a predictor of outcomes in patients with severe sepsis. So a patient who is having shock or hypertension, it would be advisable to do a cardiac echo, get an early consult if POCUS is not available at your site, because this will help you determine when the patient would actually respond to vasopressors and which are the patients who need to, which are where it is safe to use terlipressin. So if we look at the presence of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, yes or no, or even on the basis of the grade of LV diastolic dysfunction, it is a predictor of circulatory failure and of death. So look for cirrhotic cardiomyopathy in all patients with ACLR because it will be there in about 40% of all individuals. Coming to the use of non-selective beta blockers in ACLF, again, Asian data. So uh, the use of carvedilol has been found to be useful in patients in ACLF because this data from Dr. Sarin's group showed that most of them have a high HVPG, and we are always worried in patients with ACLF whether we can give beta blockers safely, especially because it can reduce the cardiac reserve, reduce cardiac output, and then lead to AKI. So the whole idea is that it can be used as long as a map can be maintained about 7 or if the cardiac index is adequate. And in this select subgroup of individuals, carvedilol provides survival benefit over placebo. So use beta blockers uh, with the mandate that cardiac reserve is preserved, MAP is preserved, that will prevent complications and would also help the patient reverse from ACLF and go to stable decompensation. So non-selective beta blockers, again, a non-transplant modality which can be used in patients which in this study at least, showed better survival. 
The next thing that we come in Asian databases is the use of gut microbiota modulation. So this was the first pilot study in eight patients with severe alcohol-associated hepatitis where fecal microbiota transplantation was done via a nasogeginal tube. Aliquots were given from a, a stable donor, a healthy donor, and they found a survival benefit of 87% versus 33% in the placebo arm. And this data was done from PGI Chandigarh, which was again only on 33 patients, which showed improvement in one month survival, but no differences in three months survival with FMT. This data has not been replicated at other sites. There have been issues with FMT, with C. difficile infection, with SPP, and with lack of efficacy. So we need more information about gut microbiota modulation via FMT and ACLF. So how can we modulate the gut microbiota safely? This interesting study from Dr. Kulkarni showed that the addition of norfloxacin for the first one month, so we normally would give this at the time of discharge, we randomized the patients to norfloxacin versus placebo, and we found that these patients had better transplant-free survival, reduced endotoxemia, without too many multidrug resistance. So the one concern was giving norfloxacin can increase MDRO. So that was not seen to be the case, nor was there an increase in fungal infections. So norfloxacin is a low-cost mortality in a patient who's recovering from non-SBP sepsis and can be explored in future studies. Next, coming to liver support systems, we have plasma exchange, which is now frequently available. So high volume would be four times the plasma volume, which has been used in ALF studies from uh, Dr. Larson's group, then we have 1.5 to 2.5 times plasma volume and even low volume plasma exchange. So earlier this would only be used for Wilsonian crisis, but now we're using this for autoimmune hepatitis, severe alcohol associated hepatitis. So these are patients with liver failure alone who would be taken towards the plex arm and for patients who have accompanying AKI, dyselectrolytemia, acidemia, it would be better to use CRRT or even a combination of the two with the hemodiafiltration filters with either albumin or um, bile salt absorption filters. So these are under evaluation, but certainly plasma exchange and CRRT are available in most centers. So now we have data, and this was shown by the first speaker, that there is a plasma exchange, this meta-analysis shown that most of these are Asian studies, pan-Asia study. So definitely if the patient does not have transplantation or there's a bridge to transplantation required, plasma exchange is an excellent modality to bridge them, provided it's done safely, without infections, and with proper monitoring. So there's data from multiple sites which favors plasma exchange including those as a non-transplant modality. So that is interesting data from Asia, and I'm sure we'll all be using it. So there's new information regarding the use of PLEX. So depending on grade one or grades of ACLF, we might use it as a bridging modality or entirely as a replacement for our transplantation. Uh, it has also been used in hepatitis B. Till nuke set in, we take care of the liver failure by PLEX. And uh, autoimmune hepatitis, it also can improve till the patient can respond to steroids. So this is Asian data where we look at non-transplant modalities. So coming to membrane versus centrifugal technique. So now we're using the centrifugal plex, which is far better than the conventional membrane plex. So I think most centers have already adopted this modality. And of course, there's a survival benefit of centrifugal plex over membrane plex or over SMT. And then Coming to GCSF, now this is a molecule that's been discussed since time immemorial. There is conflicting data even in animal models. So this is data which has been published nearly together, Western groups who have found either there's an improvement or there is worsening tissue damage with oxidative stress. So the jury is out there. I don't know how many people are still using GCSF. So the Asian phenotype may have some response, which is better. But most European studies have found that it leads to no efficacy and trials have been prematurely term uh, terminated for lack of efficacy and adverse events. Liver transplantation for ACLF, most sites, at least uh, in a non-public health cohorts, they have shown that this would be the best modality and we are doing transplants for ACLF up to grade two. Patients who have circulatory failure or more than two extrahepatic organ failures tend not to do well. So currently at our sites, we are doing it for up to one extrahepatic organ failure only and we exclude patients who are having circulatory failure until they improve. 
So this T cohort data compared the use of the scores of the ARC as well as the CLIFC ACLF. So largely for ARC 1 and 2, the ACLF, CLIFC ACLF score 1 and 2 were largely similar. And ACLF grade 3 and ARC 3 uniformly were associated with greater mortality. So possibly these patients may not do so well when we are doing a cost-benefit analysis for listing. So they might come under futility of care, but ARC 1 and 2 certainly should be looked at for liver transplantation. So this is a combined summary slide, but actually tells you in a patient who is coming with cirrhosis, once there's an acute precipitant, there's an acute decompensation stage which may amount to ACLF or not. So this is where a passel ACLF can actually determine by means of dynamic ARC scorings to categorize them into non-ACLF or grade 1 and 2. Uh, grade up one and two should immediately be moved for liver transplantation. ACLF3, provided there's no, not more than two extra hepatic organ failures, also liver transplantation. So the ones who are getting non-transplant modalities, and I've primarily discussed PLEX and CRRT with you, are probably going to be best suited in Asian cohorts where transplant is not available. So the take-home message from my talk would be, we have to prevent ACLF in Asia, really. So hepatitis B vaccination, hopefully by 2060, we are not going to see too much HPV-associated ACLF. Alcohol regulation would prevent, naturally, patients with ACLF and proper uh, alcohol use disorder treatment and linkage to psychiatric care might probably help reduce the new incidence of ACLF. The pre-ACLF stage definition needs to be incorporated into our clinical practice to identify those who are at risk of progression, especially by precipitation, which could be avoided. And then patients should be managed with adequate nutrition, possibly GCSF might help, bridging therapies such as plasma exchange or CRRT. And lastly, we have to prioritize and triage patients for liver transplantation, keeping note of the Asian phenotype of ACLF and not just use data from the West blindly. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Madhumita. I'll ask all three speakers to uh, come to the dais and initiate discussion. So we have three learned speakers. Uh, you can have question and answer. Hello. Hello. Uh, Judith Ertle, Germany, Boehringer Ingelheim. I have a question for the first speaker regarding the transplant mortality or the transplant versus non-transplant mortality. Was mortality so much higher because the patient couldn't be transplanted anymore or there was no, not enough donor organs available so that that was the reason? So is, uh, was the patient the reason they couldn't be transplanted, yes or no? A very good question. Uh, first, first of all, of course, our transplantation uh, should consider the donor. So, uh, particularly in Taiwan, currently we have a very good uh, donor education and also promote the, the donation of the other people. So, mm -hmm. uh, the shortage of the living donor uh, liver transplantation is quite low in Taiwan, I believe. Let's mm -hmm. get improved of that. Of course, when we uh, did make a decision to uh, recommend the patient to receive the liver transplantation, at this moment, of course, earlier transplantation may be, have some benefits. However, in, in the Taiwan's experience, it seems that even a little bit late, the survival is also quite good after liver transplantation. So I believe um, this may be not actually a guideline. Uh, this become an art comes from the donor condition or uh, the shortage of organ or the progression or the uh, condition of the patients. So I, I think this uh, will, uh, we need more, more studies to make sure uh, this condition. Uh, but the first, of all, uh, the first of all is uh, to make the shortage of the donor become less and less. Thank, Thank you. you. I have a question to both of you. Uh, when we talk of, I mean, we have been discussing this for last 10 years, the difference in the definitions of uh, East and the West. Uh, when you have a patient whom you want to classify as ACLF or, or for that matter, any disease, if you're giving a classification, 
it is either if they have a common prognosis or if they have a common therapy which you have to start or if you are going to prioritize them for transplantation. Now, for each of these three, if you compare the two classical prototypes, on one hand, you have a patient with hepatitis B flare coming as ACLF or alcoholic hepatitis with alcoholic cirrhosis coming, presenting versus a decompensated cirrhosis, developing pneumonia and multi-organ failure. Do you think there is any similarity between the, these two group of patients in terms of either pathophysiology, prognosis, or treatment, or transplantation at that moment? So, uh, thank you for the question. That, that's exactly the point we've been debating for the last 10 years. So, a patient who's coming with a bilirubin of 2, INR of 1.5, but has severe COVID-19, so at the outset was just a stable cirrhotic, can turn into ACLF at some point, at some point would fit in with the organ failure definitions as per the EZL consortium. So the end stage is going to be the same. The final prognosis would be the same, but the interim management for a patient who's just been drinking high jaundice, high INR, encephalopathy, all happening within four weeks, a very rapid deterioration in a person who was not known to have liver disease would be slightly different. So the approach to the patient might be different even though finally the organ failures and the outcome would be the same. So the movie starts differently but has the same ending, but we need to manage these patients quite differently. So the semantics of uh, the initial cause may not matter towards the end when we are looking at mortality outcomes, but when it comes to management protocols, they would certainly differ. A person who's having stable decompensated cirrhosis who ends up in an ICU may require a certainly different approach to a person who has been sick for the first time and now has secondary organ failures, then develops pneumonia as an ICU complication. So possibly that's going to be different. So of course we now have so many uh, models for prediction. The, the major uh, efficacy or the major effect is let us have some uh, reference to do something. That is related to maybe to the prediction of the survival uh, and also take any uh, treatment for them especially. Uh, I think uh, currently all the guidelines, when we discuss about the, the you know, the organ failure or don't in your organ failure, I think that is a dynamic change for each patient himself or herself. The condition of, of we, we all know that, uh, for example, if the, the patient get an encephalopathy or shock, I, I believe, I believe in this condition, the need for transplantation may be, may be, may be need. Uh, more, more frequency or earlier intervention uh, by introducing the uh, liver channel for them. Uh, so, uh, in, in summary, I believe we can just try to predict a, a patient with very, very poor response because maybe they don't need any other special treatment or, or particularly for the transplantation. But the second one, we have to develop a very special, uh, special, maybe the predict, uh, prognosis value or prognosis models for special patients because when we make a decision to introduce or do the transplantation is the most important time. We may identify some uh, maybe earlier stage, very mild patient may don't need it. However, if we have uh, very good uh, predictive models for very uh, aggressively exacerbation of the patients, we may uh, take the uh, introduction of the liver transplantation earlier. I think that is what we can do now. Or the, the general medicine or critical care, I think that is just uh, very similar between, between all, the, uh, all the other patients, particularly so, so many organs involved. Uh, I have one very basic question to Dr. Uh, Modumita. Uh, how do you differentiate between uh, this pre-ACLF and uh, natural course of uh, chronic liver disease? Because the condition will be almost similar. So mm -hmm. how do you differentiate? So at that point in time, it's very different to know what trajectory the patient is following. So let's take an example. The patient is drinking daily, drinks about 80 grams of alcohol, has a baseline bilirubin of 2. So a patient who has then tending to binge 
or who develops hepatitis A virus infection or takes too many steroids, that is a patient who's going to end up with a worsening bilirubin, meeting our threshold criteria, which we have arbitrarily set. So uh, if their bilirubin goes up, INR goes up, there's some other hepatic encephalopathy or appearance of ascites, they would become ACLF. But at that point in time, when they're pre-ACLF, these are patients with cirrhosis who may have prior decompensation or may have a new decompensation not amounting to ACLF. But if we treat the patient at that point, there's abstinence, there is removal of any other precipitating factor, then we can prevent ACLF from happening. So the apacel definition would actually help us. Where is the PREDICT study where Trabika et al. actually had the pre-ACLF and the undifferentiated kind and showed the difference in mortality is something that is just defined retrospectively. Whereas an apacel pre-ACLF is somewhere where we can intervene and prevent uh, secondary organ failures from happening. I just wanted to make one point here about the transplantation question, which the lady had uh, put about, the first question. So Asian patients, when they get transplanted, they do perfectly as well as a decompensated cirrhotic here or in the West. The only thing is a matter of infections. If the patient survives the first 28 days after transplant, they do exactly the same way as a non-ACLF patient. The only problem comes in, in the early perioperative period where we have patients with organ failures, those who are on CRRT, those who are just recovered from sepsis, they tend to do worse. So maybe the first 28-day mortality after transplant is bad for ACLF. But other than that, they do just as well as an average cirrhotic. So liver transplant just needs, because we need adequate organs, like uh, Dr. Chayadin has mentioned, uh, that would be the only point where there would be a differentiating factor. Dr. Akash. So uh, I'll just add to what uh, Madhumita has just said. Uh, if you look at the ARC score, you can actually uh, apply the ARC score in a patient who has come to your OPD. Whereas if you look at the CLIF score or any of the, uh, the, the other scores, they are applicable when the patient has got admitted into the ICU and has already developed organ failure. So that is where uh, the ARC score helps us in our ability to predict which patient is going to develop organ failure. Now, once they develop organ failure, obviously the prognosis is not going to be very different, which is what uh, Professor Chen was trying to tell, that once organ failure, all of them are going to have a high mortality. But if you apply the ARC score before the patient has developed organ failure, that is when you can actually categorize your patient and identify which are the patients who are going to be prioritized to be admitted and be very aggressive in your therapy. And these are the patients where, before the immune paralysis sets in, if you offer therapies like plasma exchange or other modalities, then you're, you're likely to get a benefit. But if the patient has already de developed organ failures, then most of these therapies would become mostly bridging therapies rather than curative therapies. So I think that is where the difference is. But again, uh, these are, this is oversimplification. The, in real life, things are a bit more complex, but I think this is the e easiest way to understand what I'm trying to say. Any questions from the floor? Question for uh, Professor Dai. Uh, thank you for your excellent uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I know uh, some uh, active fungal uh, drugs uh, have uh, hepatic toxicity. Yeah. Uh, uh, how, what's your uh, treatment uh, strategy about uh, uh, active fungal infection in patients with SCRIF? Uh, Preemptive uh, treatment or uh, when you get the uh, uh, definite uh, pathogen evidence? Thank you. Okay, so fungal infection is, is a, uh, really a bigger problem. However, the incidence is not so high. So I believe currently we don't uh, use the preventive treatment for the patient with ACRF. I think after the definite diagnosis and then give the treatment, the treatment, I think it's better. At least in my, my personal uh, opinion. Yeah, I agree. We don't give uh, prophylactic antifungals, except in one situation, that is if we are doing transplant for a patient with acute and chronic liver failure, then post-transplant, all these patients are put on uh, prophylactic antifungals 
and the antifungals of choice in such a situation are usually echinocandins, echinocandins like uh, anidula fungin or mica fungin, and they have to be continued for around two to three weeks. And there is a randomized control trial from Europe on this, uh, which has shown survival benefit with prophylactic use of echinocandins for three weeks post liver transplant for patients with ACLF. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Sue Kona. Yeah. Uh, what's, uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, what's the percentage of a symbol uh, sectomy uh, in your hospital uh, about uh, uh, acute uh, uh, PVT? Thank you. So, uh, excellent question. Uh, the question is, what proportion of my patients with acute portal vein thrombosis actually undergo thrombectomy, right? Yeah. So, uh, the number of patients is probably, I can't tell you the exact figure, but it's a small minority because the indications are very clear. The indications are if the patient has developed bowel ischemia or bowel congestion, and that is uh, likely to go into bowel infarction, extension into superior mesenteric thrombosis, that is one. Second, if it is precipitated ACLF, that is two. Uh, or third patient is posted for a liver transplant, three. So these are the three indications for me for doing a portal vein decanalization. Uh, out of this, the most common reason in our practice is patients who are planned for a liver transplant and despite anticoagulation, the portal vein has not recanalized. Then these are the patients where we would do a thrombolysis or a tips with portal and recognition procedure electively before undergoing the liver transplantation. Thank you. Uh, one more question to Professor Akas. Uh, you talked about this vascular disease and most of them were uh, dealt uh, about the bland thrombosis. So have you uh, came across the malignant uh, PV thrombosis or hepatic vein thrombosis causing ACLF and their management? So, uh, very interesting question. Actually, uh, when ACLF was being defined, hepatocellular carcinoma was considered as an exclusion criteria. And therefore, uh, any HCC is considered out of ACLF. Even if the patient fulfills all the criteria for ACLF, presence of HCC excludes him from being ACLF. And therefore, patients with portal vein thrombosis, tumoral portal vein thrombosis are also excluded. So we know that patients with HCC, once they develop portal vein thrombosis or hepatic vein thrombosis, they can develop a phenotype which is similar to, HCC, uh, to ACLF. But you cannot call them as ACLF because they are excluded from the definition. And Unfortunately, these are the patients where you are rarely of able to offer any therapy because they have high bilirubins, they have ascites, you can't offer them systemic therapies, you can't offer them local regional therapies, and liver transplant is contraindicated. So these are the most difficult patients of HCC to be treated. Study on uh, tips being used in uh, HCC with PVT. 30 patients just published two months ago in PMC Gastroenterology, where they used it, uh, a tips PVR kind of thing, and then they offered local regional therapy. Yeah. But these were elective cases without. Without tumoral thrombosis. This was bland yeah, thrombosis. Thrombosis, bland thrombosis. With thrombosis. With Hi, I'm Chintak from Sri Lanka. If ACLF developed because of the SBP, when are you going to do the liver transplantation? So again, excellent question. So uh, if a patient has developed SBP, when do you do a liver transplantation? So uh, typically, if you look at the Western recommendations, they would say five days of uh, antibiotic therapy is usually sufficient. What we do in our clinical practice is at least 72 hours. After 40 to 72 hours, we repeat our cytic fluid tapping. We confirm that the patient has actually responded in terms of the infection, the cell count has dropped by at least 80%. We also would want to know the culture, if it is positive, then what is the antibiotic, whether ad adequate antibiotic, appropriate antibiotic is going or not. And then usually after 72 hours, we are ready to take up these patients for transplantation. So in a cadaver setting, we are comfortable with around 72 hours. 
But if it is a living donor transplantation, then we would want to wait for at least five days. Same with you? So, I will ask uh, one more question to, uh, to you. So, since we have such a large burden of hepatitis B presenting as ACLF, uh, do you think that use of plasma exchange in patients with hepatitis B flare presenting as ACLF versus other causes of ACLF, they, the, the outcome is the same or it's different? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, currently, it seems no special uh, reports about the, the difference between these two kinds of conditions, particularly the B and the non-B conditions. Actually, in Taiwan now, we, we don't even, almost never have the ACLF comes from hepatitis B. Yeah, because currently the national guideline or national reimbursement of the nukes for the patients expanding, that is total free. Uh, no, no one dollars paid from the patients. So we treat the patient in earlier stage or for chemo therapy prevention uh, for the reactivation. Now almost all the patient can receive that. Actually, some patient happens that may be uh, under the diagnosis, under the previous diagnosis of hepatitis B. If if patient now the screen policy is quite good, we will have a very perfect. I, I think not perfect, very good, very good results of the, the prevention. So I think uh, I have talked about that. This is maybe what we can do because we cannot tolerate. We really cannot tolerate our patients with hepatitis B get the flare. Even no prevention, we have to follow up very uh, good or very frequently for them, particularly for the undiagnosed patients. This is what we can do or we want to do for the next step, uh, step in Taiwan. Thank you, and I think we should congratulate you all. And uh, the rest of Asia should really learn from Taiwan uh, how to really curtail the, and contain the disease with hepatitis B. Thank you. Uh, if no more questions, uh, I would like to thank uh, all three speakers once again. Uh, we learned a lot, and I would like to thank my co-moderator, Tokushige Sensei, and with this, I call this uh, session to be an, an end. Thank you all. Thank you very much, the moderators and discussants and also lecturers.